It is good to see everyone tonight on the St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church Expectation Moment um, uh, Zoom line and also to hear the voice of those of you who are on the prayer line. We had a wonderful time at worship day, didn't we? Praise the Lord. Val. Val. Val can't get it together. Val, can you hear me on the line? Okay, well, you said go ahead like I wasn't talking. Okay. All right, let's, we're going to get started now. Now we're going to get started. We're going we're gonna to do another takeoff. <laughs> good evening, everyone. It is good to see everyone, to hear the voice of those of you who are on the phone line. I thank God for each of you. We had a wonderful um, communion Sunday today. Um, we thank God for the praying this morning, the teaching in Sunday school, the worship today, and we thank God for closing off our day uh, with the living and expectation. We thank God, and again, I have said that God has taken us on a faith journey, so let us do this every day here. Let us consider it in terms of what it is doing to increase our faith. God is increasing our faith in this season. No doubt yeah. about it. Train passion. Let's keep our eyes on the word that God. I called a member today, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all this for a reason. I called a member. I saw a church there. I said, I need you on the on the, on the, on the uh, expectation moment two nights a week. And before she said, well, I, I said, no, no, you can be on there two nights a week. I want us to start compelling people. Y'all mind compelling. Mm -hmm. Call us the folk on the phone and said, you need to be on here a couple of nights a week. I don't want anybody to miss what God is doing. I miss through his word. I don't want anybody to miss it. I, as pastor, don't want anybody to miss it. You as believers and members and disciples of Jesus Christ and St. Peter, we don't want anybody to miss what God is doing and, and through in our midst. And so I am encouraging everyone to call somebody to tell them, you're you missing out on what the Lord is doing. If you believe you're getting something out of the word of God, let us tell somebody to not miss out on it. I had a friend of mine call me the other day and some tennis shoes I like. They won't sell. Um, he called and said, um, I'm, I'm, I got the, these shoes you like out here uh, at the Sporting Goods place. You ought to come out here and get them. I said, get them for me. He said, now you got to come get them yourself. But if you come out here, I say you get here. Let's have that same attitude. When, let's call somebody. We can't get the word for them. But what we can do is encourage them to join us as we start the word of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, tonight, we're in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm not going to hold y'all very long tonight. I want to just uh, tie some things together and, and add a couple of verses to what we're doing. Oh. We're in the... We're in the third chapter yeah. of Hebrews. I can hear you. Okay, I'm not quite sure what we're talking about. We're in the third chapter of Hebrews, uh, and we're going to pick up tonight. Okay, we're going to pick up here at, at verse 1 and try to give... I'm right here. Okay, hold on, Zoom line. We have some... some let me call back in. Line for St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. This call is being recorded. Line muted. Miss Vaughn, tell us she got to unmute me. Line unmuted. Okay. Hey. Now, Val, can you hear me? You are now a host. I'm here on the prayer line. Can you can. Can y'all hear me though? That's the key. I can hear you on the Zoom. I can't hear you on the prayer line. Okay, y'all hold on. Let me try another phone. Let me get another phone. All right, Ms. Vaughn, tell I'm calling in again on another phone. Ms. Val, he is calling in on another phone right now. Okay. I think what was happening was Val was muting the phone because she didn't recognize my, um, hold on for a second. Yeah, <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. So I'm coming in now. Tell, look out for me. You say, look out for him. He's landing now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm landing this land one more time. <laughs> Line 
for St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. This call is being recorded. Val? You are now a host. Okay, am I on the phone line? You're on the phone line. Okay, I'm ready to teach now. Can I go ahead and get started? Go ahead and get started. All right, mute everybody but me. <laughs> there we go. Now we finna have class. Can we have class? We finna have class now. <laughs> All right. All right, we're in the, I'm going to skip the beginning part. We're going to go right to the word. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to um, kind of do a summary of the first few verses, and then we're going to move right on swiftly uh, to our text, two, two verses for tonight. We understand that in chapters 1 and chapters 2, um, Paul, I'm sorry, the author of Hebrews diligently set forth an argument, a presentation to, to make sure that all the believers that were reading the book in time, in, in eternity, would understand definitively that in fact, um, Jesus was superior to the angels. That's what he wanted to make clear. He wanted to make clear to those Hebrew Christians, but likewise, he wanted to make clear to all those um, uh, Greek scholars who in their own way had found themselves um, high-minded and not, uh, not quite sure if Jesus was worthy of their focus. And so that's what happened. That's where we were. And so keeping that in mind, what I want us to understand is that was why it was necessary for um, the author to present Jesus as superior to angels. Now, likewise, let me be clear, likewise, um, um, Paul, I mean, the author wanted to understand that Jesus was superior to Moses as well. And that's what chapter three is about, um, presenting to those Old Testament um, individuals who, who still had a, a, a likening or a inkling of desire for the Old Testament and for the ways of the Old Testament, for the for Moses and for the prophets. He wanted to take a moment to make clear that Moses was a great man, Jesus was greater. So let's look at chapter three. Let me just read a few verses in the beginning. Wherefore, uh, holy brethren. He, I love the way he defines the believer. We are holy brethren of Jesus Christ. We're partaking of the heavenly calling like Jesus Christ. We are to consider, to think seriously about and focus on it. We talk about focus today, making in this case, Jesus, and understanding his work, he's the apostle sent by God, and he's the high priest, the mediator between God and man, and he is, in fact, um, um, Christ Jesus. That's just Jesus Christ. He is the apostle sent from God and the high priest, the mediator of our profession of faith in God, and he is Christ Jesus. Now, verse 2 says, he, he who was faithful to him that appointed him. What does that mean? That means that Jesus was faithful to God. That's who appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now he makes a comparison. Jesus was faithful to, 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 to God who appointed him. The same way that Moses was faithful in all his house. Remember that word house means people. Moses was faithful to God on behalf of his faith to God before his people. Likewise, Jesus was faithful to, to God for us. You remember how we always talk about Jesus was obedient to death, death on the cross? That also exhibited his uh, on uh, to him who appointed him, God, on behalf of whom he was sent to, to save mankind. Moses was sent by God to deliver his people from the bondage of Egypt. Jesus was sent by God to deliver us from um, um, sin and eternal death. Now, keeping that in mind, we see here in verse 3 that, again, we have, and an, 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 how do I want to say this? We have a, a continued comparison in verse 3. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. Now, again, the, the point is this, that Jesus has more glory than Moses because everything that is, Jesus, in fact, was, a, was built. He was a part of that building. He was in, in, in intricate in the building of everything, including Moses and the people of God. And so um, uh, Jesus was worthy of more glory. He's worthy. He's worthy. We talk about he's worthy. That means he is due more glory than Moses because he built the house while Moses and he made the people and die for the people, whereas Moses simply led the people. I know I just gave me that. That's what we must understand. That's the work, why the work of Jesus is greater than the work of Moses. Now, verse four says this, for every house is built by some man. What does that mean? Every every house there is, I don't care who, where you live, somebody built that house, but he that built all things is God. In other words, it makes clear that everything that is, God made. And so there's not anything that somebody said, well, that ain't God's. Everything is God's. Now, verse 5 says, and Moses, verily, now here's, here's another comparison. Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant 
for a testimony of those things were to be spoken after. Let's describe Moses. Moses was faithful, barely was in, in God again most make clear. Listen to this. The author uses the word that Jesus often used, was faithful in all his house. That he did give himself fully to the work that God had called him to do. But he was faithful as a servant. That means that his his direction, his instruction came directly from God, and he was faithful in following those instructions. Um, and that that faithfulness served as a testimony of those things were to be spoken of about him. In other words, the work of Moses was an indicator of the work that would come to come to pass through Jesus Christ. Again, to make a comparison, Jesus, God, Moses was appointed to bring people, God's people, out of the bondage of slavery in, in Egypt. Jesus was brought to bring us out of the bondage of sin. Moses was to bring the people out of, the, 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 of Egypt into the promised land that God had given. Jesus came to die for our sins and give us an opportunity, or no, give us the reality of eternal life in heaven in the presence of God. So we see, if you just compare that work, Jesus deserved more honor. And so, but we also understand that Moses was, had a good work. Now, verse six is where I want to hang my hat for a little while tonight. But Christ, as a son over his own house, Jesus Christ served as a son of God over his own house. That means the people that were his in the first place. Whose house are we? Now, that's our part I love. I'm going to stop here for a minute. We are the house of God, of Jesus Christ. Or, let me put it another way, we are the people of God. In First Peter, we'll call them, um, we, are, we are a holy people, a set-aside people, a sanctified people, a, sa a people set aside to God. But he also defines, describes us as a house. You remember, we were described as a temple, a, whole, a house of God. And here, we are defined in this much the same way, but we added to that, that context is that we are the people of God. And, and then, and, and, it, and he said it conditionally because he's speaking to a group of people who had an inkling to turn back to the old way of life. Now, listen to this. He says, we are the people, we are we are God's house. We are God's people. We are Christ's house. We are Christ's people. If, now that word if is a qualifier. That means it's conditional. That means there's something we must do in order to experience what God has already done. I think that's the best way to put it. That's something that each believer must do in order to experience what God has already done. This is key. This is not about backsliding. This is not about sinning and making a mistake. This is about a people who are contemplating literally turning away from God through in Jesus Christ. That's what they're contemplating. And oftentimes people today in the world today contemplating leaving their leaving behind and leaving their relationship with God behind. You know how that works. Um, if, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you just decide to walk away, you've broken the, the, the you've broken that relationship. You if you're married, you've broken that relationship. If you're dating, you've broken that relationship. Whatever the case is, if you walk away from anybody that you had a previous relationship with, you're breaking it. That's what these people were considering doing, walking away from their relationship with God in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says to them, listen, you are, he's saying to the people that he's writing to in Hebrew, saying to us today, you are the people of God. We can say like this, we are the people of God if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. In other words, here's what we must do. And it's not impossible. It's not hard. It's simply a, 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 it's simply a calling to us to be faithful to who's been faithful to us. That's what it boils down to. First of all, it says that we hold fast. That word hold, and you're going to see that a couple more times in the book of Hebrews. Y'all know what holding on mean. If you're about to slip off something, you, you get a firm grip so you won't slip away. If, you've hold, if you're holding on to somebody, you're gripping and making sure that your focus is on holding on to them. He's simply saying that we must hold on. And that word hold fast means that we must be do it not just a time, but we must continually to commit ourselves to holding on to, to the confidence. So picture this. People are turning away. Uh-uh. I -uh. says, hold on. People say, I, I, I'm tired today. No, the day is the day you need to hold on. What do you want me to hold on to? He says, I want you to hold fast to confidence. You know what confidence is. That we believe without a doubt that, that some there's going to be some outcome um, that is predicated upon a promise. In this case, that there's a sure outcome of our deliverance, our salvation, and our eternity with the Lord because God promised it. And Jesus delivered it by his death and resurrection. So we're to hold fast. Let me put, put it like this. We're going through the day. And you're getting beat up by the day. I mean, the day is beating you up. You just say, well, that's all right. The Lord's going to take care of me. And I got a place in, in glory. 
that, that that that's your holding on that's your confidence you have confidence no matter what that what god has promised will come to pass i want you to think about that that that's something sometimes we think oh that's so deep past time that's so spiritual but actually it's something that will give your life a new meaning it will give you a new outlook on life if you know that god is not going to leave you he's never going to leave you nor forsake you the author is going to talk about this if you know that god is never going to get too busy for you he'll hear your prayer and if you know ultimately god is going to bring you into his kingdom you just say you know what i don't care how what what's going on i'm going to hold fast i'm going to be confident not in myself but i'm going to be confident in god doing just what god said he would do what does he say? He said, we hold fast to confidence and the rejoicing. This part of life is almost, I, no, this is what he's saying. Be confident that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Hey. But then because you're so confident, rejoice in what you're confident in. See, sometimes we waiting on the end game to say, oh, this is great. The author saying rejoice in the midst of because you're confident that what's going to happen, that God is going to do what he says. So you just say, thank you, Lord. I'm rejoicing because I know what you promised is going to come to pass. That is, in fact, the posture of the believer, that we may be, we must be confident and we must rejoice simultaneously as we have confidence. Matter of fact, when you start rejoicing, Lord, and that's what happens to some of us sometimes, we so down about stuff that we can't, we not confident. But when you have confidence and you rejoice in it, it bolsters your confidence in, in, in who you're confident in. So sometimes when you feel down, praise the Lord. I know the songs that say this, and I believe this to be true. When we praise the Lord, Satan got to run. But also when we praise the Lord, our confidence grows. We're reminded of just how good God is. That's what I want us to understand. Being sad is unfortunately something that happens in this world if something happens in our flesh. But being confident is a spiritual move to combat our sadness. Can I say that? Being confident and rejoicing in the Lord is a methodology in which we combat. We are we can able to fight back on sadness and sorrow and depression that does in fact creep in our lives. If you if anybody say I ain't never been sad, that's not true. But how do we address our sadness? By being confident. These people it was being written to in the book of Hebrews were sad because of what they were going through. Maybe things they wanted, they couldn't get. And the author said, don't go backwards. Just rejoice in the, in the hope of the confidence. Rejoice confidently knowing that what God says is going to come to pass and, and rejoice in it of the hope. We know what hope is. That's the expectation right there. Be confident. Rejoice. In, 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 in the, in the, as a result, and in the hope, the expectation, the promise that is coming closer. So if confidence means you know it's going to happen and you rejoice as you know it's going to happen, hope means you see it coming closer. That's what it means. Hope means you see what is being promised coming closer. I, I, the Bible says this, and I love it. Every day, I want somebody to hear this, we're closer to our salvation than we were yesterday. Can I say Every day. Like tomorrow, we're closer to our salvation than we were today. Why? Because we're coming closer to the, the fulfillment and the manifestation of the promise of God. That's what the author is saying here. Let me hit this last verse. This last part of the verse. And he says, rejoice in the hope, firm unto the end. We got to be firm in our confidence. That means, I used to love to hear Reverend David say, I'm a firm believer. Anybody remember him saying that? He's a believer. What did that mean? Reverend, that mean, Reverend David said he was a firm believer. That means couldn't nobody shake him in what he believed. And that's what God wants us to be as Christians. He wants us to be firm, that we're just standing solidly and strongly on what we believe because we believe that what God promises we're going to come to pass. That's that's some stuff we need to have. So, Thomas, if you're on here, write this down and throw it on my desk at your convenience. Here's what the Christian has to be. We have to be, we have to be, in verse 3, we have to be, let me write me this down. We must be, we must hold fast, then under that, with confidence, then under that, with rejoicing, and then under that, with a hope, under that, that is firm, and then under that, until the end. That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. Our hope has to last us, and we must be firm in our hope, I should say, until the end. When is the end? Let's crash the sky. When is the end? When the trumpet sounds. When is the end? When the dead in Christ are get caught in the meat. Jesus and that we should be caught up to that's when we should be confident into that moment we should be firm and we should not be shaken in this world in which we live in there are thousands and countless doctrines there are, there are Christian doctrine I mean sorry there are spiritual doctrines there are human doctrines that cause us to want to focus on that but all the author is saying is we must fix our eyes 
in our hearts and be confident and simultaneously rejoice in the hope and firmly hold on to that hope, that expectation, looking to watch it come until the end. Let me give you a quick picture the Lord just gave me. In the book of 1 Kings, we see um, that, that it had been a drought of the land for a long time and Elijah uh, had, had been harassed by, um, by the king and his wife Jezebel, Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And then uh, when he said it was going to rain, uh, he went and and, 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 and and planted himself and he would send his servant to go and look and see was the rain coming. And finally, listen to this, finally, the servant came back and said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Well, that was all Elijah needed to know because he knew when that cloud came that it was going to be some more clouds joining and there was going to be a rain that was on the way. That's the way we have to look at our salvation. That is coming. And every day we must know it's closer. It's closer. It's closer. It's closer. And we must hold on to that firmness the same way. That, that Elijah, I believe, rejoiced because when that cloud came, he knew the rain was coming. We must rejoice because we know that Jesus is going to, in fact, come back. And we're just holding firm. That's all we can. We're holding firm. Not in sadness. We're holding firm, rejoicing. We're hoping. Not, uh, not sure, but we're hoping and rejoicing with firmness and holding on until the promise of God comes to pass. That's, my brothers and sisters, what God wants us to do in our lives. And that is it's what allows us to be the people of God. Anybody can come to church and say, I got a relationship with the Lord and leave out, but can we hold firm? Can we rejoice? Can we have hope until the end? I'm going to stop here tonight at 722, but I pray that these words gave us some encouragement. I pray that these words strengthen us in our earthly in our earthly walk as we walk toward heaven, our home. I pray that these, these things will give us comfort, peace, joy, and cause us to love God and love each other as well. Let us pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come tonight to say thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We honor in you and we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for 22 minutes in your word. And I pray God tonight that as a result of your word, that we would by your power be strengthened in our inner man, that our hands and feet will be strengthened by your word, that our hearts will be strengthened, that we may be strengthened in our inner man, that our ears we finally are tuned to hear your word, that we may hear your word over the world. I pray, God, that your word will allow, get in our hearts and minds, that we may uh, have peace and surpass us all understanding, and that we may be able to resist the fire darts of Satan. I pray, God, that your word will get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and our throats, that we may stand strong in you. Lord, even beyond that, Lord, that as we stand, as we hear your word, we can declare it uh, to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, I pray this night as we bid farewell that you bless every household, every family, and every individual Christian. I pray God tonight as we get ready to say see you tomorrow, as we uh, uh, take a, take time, and I ask you to keep your hands on us and keep our eyes on you, that tomorrow at the appointed time, we come together again to study your word. God, give us peace. Give us joy. Build the hedge of protection around us that the fire dies the same we quench. Give us the capacity to rejoice in you and give us, Lord, we pray, the posture pray that we can say thank you in all things. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless the St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. Hold on. Hold on. Zoom.